Well, we're hanging in there. Barely. Razzled, dazzled, and frazzled, but we're here. Barely hanging in there. Hanging in there. We're hanging in there, doing all we can. It's yep. been uh, it's been quite the ride. Yes, it has, and it ain't over with. Yep. And for you folks out there that, and I, and I don't, I don't. It, this is not to, to mean to be boastful at all, but because uh, I know a lot of people struggling out there, but. You know, imagine if you took a, your small business a little bitty, we just a little fish in the pond, and then you all of a sudden ramped it up by several hundred percent. With, and trying to do that with the same amount of employees, that's basically what we've been trying to do. It's been challenging, but we've been thankful that we've been able to hang on and, and be able to be a service to some folks because there's a lot of people out there that ain't near as fortunate as what we are. Right, right. And there's still some of, our, some of the other players out there that are – can't ship or just, uh, I know Johnny's restricted their stuff just to commercial orders so a lot of people out there are struggling yeah. just to get them out. Yeah they are uh, you know it's across the board I, I was a gun shop I ordered some ammunition from and they sent me and it's been two weeks since uh, I placed it and they sent me a video and they had well they was getting out 3,700 orders a day mm -hmm. they was backed up 180,000 orders Wow. It's hard to get caught up with Man. that. It's hard to get caught but up. But what we're seeing right now, I don't know about, I, I haven't kept up with the ammunition gun thing, but there's a run on ammunition and gun, just like they are every time there's a little bit of a problem. There's all, everybody sort of leans to that. But I'm going to tell you something else there's a run on. Gardening and chickens. Chickens, yeah. Everybody now wants some chickens. I'm talking about people you ain't even think about. Talking about chickens. My neighbor come over yesterday and says, we think about getting some chickens. I said, you you just now think about getting some chickens? <laughs> but uh, they everything's, the chicken business is fixing to skyrocket. Because yeah. everybody is thinking, man, I can get me some chickens, have me some eggs all the time. We've been doing that for years. But now right. they're just starting to realize the importance of it. Now, these folks that, that got a, a surplus of egg-laying hens is going to get filthy rich here pretty quick. And what we're seeing here in our business is we're seeing a lot of people call wanting advice and want a little bit of guidance, new gardeners. A lot of people gardening for the very first time in the last two or three weeks have decided they want to put a garden in. I'm assuming that they want to grow their own food because they see the importance of it, but also they're at home and they got plenty of time. They want an activity for them to do at home. And what better one is that than garden? Yeah, I was uh, talking to a lady the other day and I, I, I didn't, we never got down to where she was actually from or at, but uh, she lived in a suburban neighborhood. It sounded like, of course, there was a homeowners association there and she was trying to find uh, a kit or something that everybody in her homeowner association could purchase kind of as a whole distribute those kits and so everybody in their neighborhood could grow their own food and, yep. and when you start hearing stuff like that that's pretty enlightening to, to tell you like these people who have never grown a garden before are finding things important that they otherwise uh, used to not Well they can't before. travel I mean their life's been turned upside down they can't do things and they're they're starting to reevaluate where they need to put their emphasis on and that's what we're seeing uh, gardening uh, I tell you something else, small livestock, uh, goats and things like that, you're going to see a resurgence of that. You don't remember, and I, I don't either, but back in the day in World War II, they talked the government had a campaign out called the Victory Garden, yeah. where they encouraged people to grow a garden. I'm mm -hmm. not going to say we see that again, but we're going to see within ourselves a rising up in people who want to grow a garden and, and be a little bit more self-sufficient. It's two-phase. It is a process of wanting to know that you can grow your own food, but also it's a little bit of a... Uh, a mindset of thinking that you know I'm gonna be able to take care of myself a little bit instead of depending on others. Yeah, and I, I don't think this is a short-lived thing. I think we're gonna see this boom in in interest in gardening. Uh, this thing's is gonna stretch out several years. We saw a little bit of that back on the tail end of the 2008 recession. I think we're gonna see uh, even probably more of a, a sustained interest here. And uh, hopefully we get a lot of new people learning how to grow their own food and they stick with it. Yeah, it now I, by no means am I happy the way it happened. I wouldn't for, I wouldn't, I, I don't, wouldn't for nothing wish that again. I mean, I, I wouldn't, but I'm glad there are people going back a little bit and, and find out what's important instead of being a little too worldly, bringing it on back down and, and realizing what's important. Yeah. It's, it's terrible that it had to happen like this. It really can't is. Can't go to the gym, but I guarantee you can get plenty of exercise oh, yeah, out there yeah. in the garden. Yeah. Well, I'm hungry. I don't know about you. I, I am, am too. Hungry. Been a long, hard day. <laughs> I'm hungry. We about to eat something right here. So this right here is my sauerkraut I made. 
with them big old gaudy cabbages. And I had a fella call the other day, and he said, he kind of was whispering like he was worried you was going to hear it. He said, <laughs> he said, uh, he said, I want to let you know I grew some of them big old cabbages too. Don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I have, I bought that five gallon big old fermenting crop because I tend to go overboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and it this been sitting in there about three weeks. There wasn't no mold in it or anything. I checked this morning. Uh, all the liquid had kind of been reabsorbed or I, however that process works. But there was a lot of liquid in there at one point and now, now it's pretty, um, pretty much just cabbage. Uh, one question I've got for you people out there who have done this a lot. Now that I've got all this sauerkraut made, how do I keep it? How do I preserve it? I, I, know, I don't think you want to can it and, and heat it up. But uh, you just put it in the fridge in a jar. How do I, you know, seal it up? And, and how long will it stay good for that? Yeah. How long will it stay in the fridge? So any of you out there that's got some good ideas there, uh, let us know. So we got sauerkraut from some cabbage I grew. Okay. And then right here... We've got some hamburger buns. Now, I grew these from transplants Did you? Uh, back in uh, January, and uh, I was worried they wasn't going to make it and uh, kind of babied them along, but they're finally there. we got some nice little buns there. Hmm. And then um, and then some sausage here. Now, this sausage, I direct seeded this sausage. I would have really preferred to have a little Duke's mayonnaise, but we can make do with some mustard and ketchup. I reckon I just, just mustard. Do, uh, How about that? Poke me with your teeth there. Yeah, we're just going to have to do it this way for right now. I like just mustard on mine. I guess that's the way I like mine. Now, I was going to get some bratwurst, but I couldn't find any. That would have been the traditional thing to eat with, uh, with the sausages here. And y'all just bear with us. We've been at it hard all day hungry and for, forgive that phone ring and it's been ringing off to it we finally sometimes just have to walk away from i hate to say that but we just have to kind of walk and go on down to the house or we'd be up here 24 7 yeah, after five o'clock we just have to kind of walk away so i'm gonna get me some of this sauerkraut now i did one error i made i didn't shred it up as much as i probably should have well them well, big old cabbages though it's you, hard that, it's that. hard to find yeah. a shredder that can handle that yeah anywho I'm going to uh, indulge. Can I borrow your fork here? I have sampled a little bit of this earlier today when he was in here bragging on it, and I told him the same thing. He didn't shred it up enough. But you know what? After I ate it, it ain't bad to have texture like this. It ain't bad at all. I have had some sauerkraut that's kind of soggy before. That right there has got a good crunch to it. That's good. Um, a little sour to it. Got a little sour to it. And we did three tablespoons her big old head of cabbage. You ain't gotta weigh it. If you can grow them big old cabbages like that, do you three tablespoons per big old head of cabbage. That's three tablespoons of what? Salt. Salt. And you got to massage it in there good. But this is my first batch of sauerkraut I made. I'm pretty happy with it. Um, not to say we can't do better, but uh, I can live with that right that's there. Pretty that's good. good stuff. Yeah, that's pretty good. I can eat on that quite a bit. All right. We've got to say hey to everybody. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And we're glad to have you mm -hmm. with us tonight. Uh, we've got a really good show planned. We're going to be talking about some watermelons in a little bit. If this is your first time watching our show, welcome. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below and that bell button so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you're a frequent viewer of the show, it's always good to have you back. And for you new people out there, this is the longest running father and son gardening show on the internet. Woo! What you talking about? And uh, we're getting close to episode 100. This is episode 96. Before we get into talking about watermelons, uh, a few other things. So, my timing has been a little off this year with planting my garden. Just not on everything. I did good on my beans. You know, my tater timing was off. We had a video coming Well, if out. you want to eat a little bit, I need to talk about that tater thing just a minute. Okay, okay. I did want to get another Travis uh, posted a video this week, uh, a belly aching and squalling about his taters rotting in the ground. I don't like belly aching. Well, let me finish here. <clears throat> and I watched that thing, and I thought to myself, the boy didn't listen to me. If you'll go back about three episodes and watch us talking about taters, I kind of laid it out plain. And some people evidently didn't listen to what I said, so I'm going to say it again tonight. You may want to get you a piece of paper and a pen out and write this down for tater planting next year. But this is what happens, and this is the same thing Travis felt uh, felt guilty of. 
What happens is around the 10th of February, everybody gets itching a little bit wanting to plant the potatoes. Your brother-in-law or your neighbor down the road, he's going to plant his and he's going to come up and rub it in a little bit and he's going to say, well, I got potatoes planted and he's going to kind of stare up there in the sky. He ain't going to say nothing. It's going to be an awkward moment of silence. And what that does is puts pressure on you. And it pressures you thinking, man, he's going to have taters before I'm going to have taters. So you jump out there right behind him just as quick as you can and get your taters in the ground. And next thing you know, you are going to make a video where you are squalling and belly aching about your taters rotting. What I'm fixing to lay on you right now is a little bit of wisdom that I have come up with over the period of years. And I said this a couple weeks ago, and I don't think nobody paid no attention to it. Don't get in a hurry planting your potatoes. We got a two to three window there, week window there that is fine to plant your potatoes. And you have to kind of play with that on kind of what kind of year you're having. And what happens is, if you'll notice around the first of March every year, the wind starts blowing. And then big old pines, they start swaying back and forth. What that's doing is telling them pine trees to wake up. It's time to come out of that winter nap. And that that wood starts stretching and bending and it starts taking up that sap out of the ground and it sucks a lot of moisture up and it dries that ground out a lot so around the first of march what we see when that sap starts rising in them trees as our ground warms up a little bit is the moisture leaves the ground so i always wait about the end of february to plant my potatoes because if i do have a good rainy session or spell after that that sap rise will take care of my problem a lot of times. I've had one crop of rotted potatoes as far back as I can remember. And I kind of changed it around a little bit. And I do this here and I've been successful ever since. But you can't be worried about somebody making a tater a week or two before you do. Just kind of lay low, get your plan together, get a clear head on you. And when the timing is right, you want to go out and plant them. And I, I'll, I'll have a, I got a pretty crop, pretty crop. I'm going to have to. Well, we have to supply the whole family with potatoes because Travis didn't make none. So you can't jump the gun and you can't let other people get you all up and bothered and make bad decisions. you got to be focused and think straight. Now, what I just laid on you there is a little bit of wisdom from an old man. So think about what I said. <laughs> and, and for next year, tater time, I want you to really concentrate on that. Yeah. I, I The few tater plants I got look pretty good, and I've seen yours, and uh, we'll, we'll just have to compare what we got. I got about 30 row feet that made it. I got every one I planted. I know you do. I know you do. You got a, lo you got a little more sandier soil. It drains a little better. I did get in a hurry. I'll admit that. Lesson learned. But I just feel like I have a little bit of a, a bad luck run this year on my timing planting, as I was getting to before you had to go in your filibuster there. Um, my sweet corn. I planted my sweet corn. Yeah, I knew it was going to come rain. Planted my sweet corn yesterday. Got my, uh-oh, Sammy's over here wanting some sausage. Got my sweet corn in the ground right before that rain came, which is always a good thing. And dang if it ain't struck off cool on me. With that triple sweet corn needing some warmer soil temps. I mean, it didn't get up to about 55 today. You may still be okay on that. It may. I think it's going to warm back it's up the next warm day back or up. two. I think he's still going to be odd on that. But that, that's just kind of how I feel the look yeah. I've been having a little yeah. bit. But anyway, uh, I want to give a stock update on a few things. We talked about how busy we've been earlier. Uh, had a few people get upset because they got they bought a wheel hoe and there wasn't no Hoss logo on the side of it. Well, our stamping machine is toe up and... With all this going on, the chance of getting somebody out here to fix it is pretty rare. We had to get somebody out of Jacksonville, Florida, a technician, because this is a specialized piece of equipment. And I had called down there and scheduled it right before all this broke loose. And of course, they just can't get It's not qualified as essential, so they can't get nobody up here. We have plans when things get back normal, get back get it back yeah. going. So we had two options. We either just don't ship any wheel hose, or we ship them without the logos on the handles. And I didn't realize everybody really liked the logo on the handles that much. Um, but we apologize, and um, I promise you they work just the same with or without the logo. Another thing, uh, Horda Nova Trellis. We were running a little short on Horda Nova Trellis. We just got another truck loaded that in. That stuff has been flying. We got plenty of that and plenty more on the way. We should be all right on that. So if you've been needing to get some of that, we got some. I'm going to give Sammy one little bite. You reckon that'll mess up? She might not be satisfied. Well, that's what I'm thinking. The last thing on the drip tape layer attachment. A lot of people have been asking about this thing, so I'll let you give a little update. 
on that. I hope next week I have called and begged and pleaded with people that's making my parts on that. And uh, and I'm hoping next week. I can't make any promises, but I'm hoping. Okay. 15 mil irrigation tape. We got that on back order. It was supposed to ship the 26th, which was last Thursday or Friday. Thursday? Oh, not out. And we expecting it any day. We had another shipment. There was some chemicals shipped the same day out of California. They came in today. So my hope is tomorrow we get some 15 mil taper and get all them orders out. Last thing I want to mention here before we talk about watermelons, because I've been dealing with this on a few customer service calls. I meant to bring one. But that little 12 PSI pressure regulator we use on the drip tape kit. Had some people calling and the lines blowing out on the tape or different things happening. And a lot of people think that it's a pressure issue. I've never seen it be a pressure issue, folks. That little thing can handle up to 90 PSI. I haven't seen a well that does 90 PSI. Most of them are a little below 50 like mine. It's almost always a flow rate issue. That little pressure regulator can handle a flow rate of 0.5 to 8 gallons a minute. If you're above 8 gallons a minute, it's like the thing's not even there because uh, it's just a little ball valve, basically. Now, yes, that company, that Sininger that makes those, uh, makes one that looks just pretty similar that goes up to 15 gallons a minute flow rate, and we probably need to, to start carrying them at some point. You can find them online. So if you have trouble with that filter regulator and you don't think it's reducing the pressure like it's supposed to, it's probably because your flow rate's too high. You can measure that pretty easily with a bucket and uh, check that, and, and most of the time, that's the source of the problem. Yeah, I had a fellow call yesterday, and he blew five, he hit that and blew it out five times, and I said, it, I, I never, I learned a long time ago, I never say never. 99% of the time, when you start blowing out your drip tape, you got too much pressure and volume out there. Too much flow most of the time. Yeah. Well, it would be one or the other. You got too much on it and it's blowing out. Barely ever have we had any tape that went bad and um, caused that issue. It's normally an a application issue of some sort. All right, so we're going to talk about watermelons this week. And I know the last few videos we've done, we talked about staples and we talked about, you know, you got to grow. Uh, staples, meat and potatoes during this time, but I'd be dog if, if we hadn't been talking about doing a watermelon show for a while, and we're just going to talk about watermelons. Man, I love watermelons. Did I, did I, did I say and I you love You planted them? some watermelons. I did. I planted them over the weekend, and I like to look I, for years, for years, I planted crimson sweets. It was just like clockwork. You couldn't talk me out of nothing else. And I still love them, but since we got into seed business, I felt like I need to try other things. Mm -hmm. So every year I'm trying a new variety. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Last year I grew Moon and Stars, but this year I'm growing Sangria. That just sounds good. It does, it? doesn't it? Mm. I can't wait for some. So let's let's talk about watermelon varieties real quick, and then we'll talk about techniques. So let's talk about the old kind of heirloom slash OP varieties first, and you can you can. Uh, you know a lot more about watermelons than I do, so I'll let you kind of add in what you like about each of these varieties here. We'll talk about these, then we'll talk about some of the hybrids like the sangria, uh, the one you're growing this year. So, uh, as far as the heirloom OPs go, let me get them in some kind of order here. First one we got here is the Charleston Gray, which is a more elongated watermelon. Uh, I'm guessing this one might have been popular up uh, on the the Carolina coast a little bit no, that it, way? it was popular. It was developed up in that way, Charleston, but it was popular down here. Back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, on up into the 80s, this was the watermelon that was shipped by rail car up north. It has a very good shipping quality to it. It has a thicker rind. It was developed to be able to ship. And this watermelon was whole good. And the man, I can, I can remember them shipping them by freight car from around here up north, watermelons now. It's, it had to hold good bit of And it's a consistent smaller size watermelon. So it was back in that day, it was one of the smaller watermelons, but it was always consistent. It was easy to pack and had a thick rind on there. Okay, so that's our Charleston Gray. Now this one here, this Georgia Rattlesnake, if I do remember correctly, I think I could be getting it confused with another variety, but I think we sent Danny and Juan to deep south some of these because Danny said his daddy or somebody was related to him used to grow a heap of these back in the day and he kind of wanted to uh, try them again. Yeah, it's real similar if it is not a variety that we know around here is Jubilee. 
Yeah. Well, it's just a lot. Now, there's different strains of the Jubilee, and I think that's where the rattlesnake comes in at. There's one called a giant one that I growed one year, and more than things get huge. If you wanted to put it in the county fair, that was the one to grow. It was a giant, and it looked just like that. They don't taste worth it. But they get so big, you can't tote them out of the field. We grow them, I don't know how big they get, and if we cut them, they still be green. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing they get for those big old giant ones is for the county fair bragging rights. But this rattlesnake here is real similar to the, just the Jubilee variety. This was really popular with the market farmers and everything back in the 80s, early 90s. Uh, it, was, it was probably the most sought after variety back then. The Georgia rattlesnake, and then we got the moon and stars that you, you grew last year. And we got uh, yellow and red moon and stars. So if you like a yellow meated, or uh, they call it yellow meated. I'll show you a true yellow meated one, but the, the yellow meated watermelons are kind of orangish a, a lot of the time. Yeah, my memory service, Marit, this variety was released back around 1918, way back in the day. And in the early 1900s, this was a staple. Now, by the time the 70s and 80s come around, this one had kind of fell out of flavor and was replaced with a lot of other varieties that maybe was bred a little more disease resistant. But you talking about an old heirloom variety that was the staple of the South back then? That was it. My granddaddy grew the, moon, the red moon and stars. And I had a fella ask him the other day, he said, he had guessed he was wanting to grow them for market. He wanted to know that every single watermelon have a moon and the stars on it. And, and from our experience of growing last year, they do. There are some variation on how big the moon is. Uh, but but everyone seems to have a big yellow spot, one big yellow spot and a bunch of little. Yeah, I had spots. never seen one that didn't. Then we got um, the old sugar baby. And, and I didn't realize this, and we started carrying this variety this year, but this one here has quickly become our most popular OP variety. And I don't know if it's just because it has a lot of name recognition or people like the smaller size of them or what it is, but this Sugar Baby is super, super popular. Yeah, it used to be in the supermarkets uh, back when I was coming up, especially up north, you'd see a lot of these Sugar Babies more of a personal size watermelon. Right. Yeah. So a lot of people, I've never grown one. I've seen them all my life, but I've never grown one. They maybe, got that dark rhino on yeah, maybe black something on that I had to put on my list to do. That's one reason I don't grow a lot of watermelons is because I, I can't really put them in my vegetable bags. As much as I like to eat watermelons, I have to have some dual purpose crops. And uh, so if I did do one, I might have to do one like this. It was a little smaller. Yep. Uh, then we got this one here, Tender Sweet Orange. I've had several people uh, call and order a heap of these seeds. They're going to grow a bunch of them for market. It's a pretty looking watermelon. Looks it is. mighty, mighty tasty. Uh, that's the OP variety there. And then your favorite here, uh, the Crimson, Crimson Sweet. Sweet. Yep, and there on the cover is uh, Travis's oldest one, Abram. And my that's donkey. back when he was a little guy. And my donkey, Ringo, or as the boys call him, Hubba Hubba. Sharing one. Share one of my fine watermelons. Yep, and that, that's where we load them up right there. If you can see that picture, you can go on the website and see it too. But load them up underneath that pecan tree and just go out there and eat you one every day. So that's, uh, if you go see any of our older watermelon videos, it is talking about crimson sweet for the most part. Now let's get into our hybrids. And I talked about yellow one earlier. We got this one here, this hybrid called Baby Doll. And uh, I believe we, you're going to have to grow this one one of these yep. years. Uh, but it, it's a bright yellow meated watermelon, pretty looking watermelon. If I was going to grow a off color uh, yellow orange watermelon for market, I believe that's one I'd have to try. That has just man, a bright color to it. Pretty, ain't it? Yep, pretty. Contrasting. We got that baby doll there. If you wanted something different, uh, you could, if you had one of them sliced open at a market farmer stand, you could surely draw some people oh, in yeah. there. Then we got. These three here, which are hybrids, and they're called all sweet types. So, which means they're a little sweeter than crimson sweet. And we got three different ones here, and I kind of categorize these on size. So, you got the Dolce Fantasia, you got the Sangria, and you got the Jamboree. The Dolce Fantasia is going to be your smallest. Sangria is going to be somewhere in the middle, about 20, 25 pounds, and your Jamboree is going to be you big honking 30 pound watermelon. Yeah, days to maturity on some of these around 90 days, just like the baby doll at 70 days. That's quite a difference there in days to maturity on that. Yeah, so these are what they call the all sweet types. I've had some people call and ask what all sweet means. It's a, 
Uh, I think there is a variety out there called all sweet, but all sweet is just a general word for a certain type of hybrid watermelon, mm -hmm. like a category. Yep. All right, let's get into some planting and growing tips. You want to get your transplants out there? Mm. So you can direct seed watermelons. Man here always likes to transplant the watermelons. Those there look pretty, pretty right to go. Yep. These are some ones I got mine planted. This is what I had left over, and I'll keep these. Those are your plan B's. These are my plan B's. In case we get somebody like the dog running through our air mess them up, then I'll go back and replant them. But you see that root system there? That's exactly. Mm -mm. Uh oh. I dropped my microphone. That's about where you want it to be. Now, these things are a little tender, so you have to be careful with them. You don't want to break them off. But when you get ready to transplant them, that's about a perfect size there. It's putting those true leaves on there. It's not too root bound, but just about right. You want to plant them about root height there, you, wherever the, the soil line is, is where you want to put them back at. Of course, I always use drip irrigation on my watermelons. And, uh, I had a fellow asking me the other day, he was asking about growing. Uh, winter squash transplants or watermelon transplants in these 162 trays. He said, man, them sales just don't look like they're big enough for a winter squash or watermelon. But, um, yeah, it works perfect. Look at there. There ain't nothing wrong with that right there. That's just where you want it to be. That's a pretty looking transplant. Now, if you get a plant much bigger than this, it's going to go through too, too much transplant shock. And that's what happens. Everybody wants to go to the big box store and buy them big old plants. Now, if you go up there, even Bonnie sells some watermelon plants up there at the big box stores. And them old plants are starting to put runners on and, and they big. And you buy that carry at home, it's going to shock that plant too much. This is the ideal stage right here where you can put it in the ground, go through very little shock, get it caught back up, and get it running on. This is where you want to be. And, and putting these on drip irrigation, very, very important because watermelons are cucurbit. They can be susceptible, as you like to say, to yeah. some of those fungal yeah. diseases. Yeah. So we want to minimize that leaf moisture if we can. And plus, you can, you can put them underneath there and you, you can get that water right there to them. It don't take near as much as it does at overhead irrigation. Now, if you're growing them on drip tape, you can stack them in there a little thicker than you can if you're not, can't you? Yeah, I catch myself putting them about every two foot apart. And sometimes I'll put them every foot apart. Now, my row spacing is allowed to be five or six foot between mm -hmm. my rows, but my inline row, I, I pack them in there pretty tight, foot to two foot. Let apart. them grow out that yep. way instead of, yep. uh, yeah. And if you got them on drip, you can keep them all fed. It ain't a big deal. Yeah, and you can't be trouncing around out there when your vines start growing. Trouncing. Trouncing around out there, moving your sprinkler because you're going to be stepping all over everything. And that's another reason that drip comes into play because you can just turn it on. You don't have to be meddling around out there stepping on all your watermelon vine. Yeah, and you, you ain't going to have to worry about a lot of weed pressure between the rows. You ain't going to have to be getting out there trouncing and weeding. Cause, trouncing. That's our new word, trounce. Because uh, you got your drip right there in the middle. You ain't watering yep. Now, watermelons are one of them plants that you need some pollinators on. So if you ain't got pollinators, you need to plan on getting you a beehive or two and putting it there. Make sure that you got pollinators because if you don't, you, you're going to be hurting a little bit on your yield. That's right. That's right. So... A foot to two foot plant spacing on drip and then row spacing on out five feet or so. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about pests and disease issues because if we have a real rainy year, like uh, we tend to have every now and then, a real rainy spring, that can cause some problems for watermelons. The best disease control you can do on watermelons is rotation. And the best thing to do is plant them on new ground if possible but if you can't you definitely want to plant them somewhere they ain't been watermelons or cucurbits there for at least three or four years you want to do a good rotation and that's going to help you the most this is new word too most this is most do you have yeah. any bug problems on your watermelons? i have i i don't know i've ever had any bug problems on watermelons mildew i've had a little mildew if it turned off if it turns off and we start having a lot of you can get some mildew in there yeah, you can get some anthracnose and some other things. You can get some diseases in there you can't do nothing about, so they ain't you some worrying about a lot. But you can get a little mildew in there. It don't hurt to keep them sprayed. If you're going to have a few days of overcast, rainy weather, it'd be nice to have a contact fungicide or systemic uh, fungicide on there. Put some liquid copper on there. Liquid copper, some like complete disease control, something like that. Now, if you get too much rain, you can also have what they call... And you walk out there and the watermelons have what blowed up on you. Yeah, they'll do that every now and then. But you know what happens? A lot of times when the watermelon blows up, 
too much fertilizer at the wrong time. Uh oh. Yep. I learned that years ago. Pop too too much at the wrong time. When that watermelon starts forming and getting less right here, you got to be careful throwing that fertilizer to it. You want to do most of your fertilizing before it starts maturing that fruit. So early, Mama's early like on. Onion. You want to grow that just like an onion. You want to grow that vine, and when it starts setting fruit, you want to back off it just a little bit. That's good to know. That's good to know. Now let's talk about when to harvest. Uh, you, when you're harvesting the watermelon, you'll hear people talk about thumping it, listening to it, looking at the underside of it, whatever. But the main thing you'll look at is that tendril, or what you call that curly curly cue. Cue. The first ones that come off, you need to let that curly cue dry real good because they're going to be a little bit on the green side and that vine is still growing well and it's going to take them a little bit harder to get ripe. So the very first ones, I, I do it every year, I always cut the first one is still green when I cut it and I get mad at myself, kick something, dog or something's up there, I'll kick something, stomp around a little bit and I get back at my business. But that first one is going to be, you get, it's just hard to wait. Let that curly cue dry all the way up real good, maybe give it an extra day or two. After that, when those things, those vines start maturing, after that, when that curly cue dries up, you can go out there and clip them and have pretty good confidence and they're going to be ripe. But that first couple of them will get you every year. Now, as far as storing the watermelons, that, they seem like they hold for a couple of weeks for you, or at least. I put them on a big old picky tree. Big old picky tree. Every now and then we'll put one in the house. Uh, if it'll fit in the refrigerator, ain't nothing. Them cold watermelons is real good. Now, growing up, what we did, if you've got your air vents, where I live now, they're in, in the roof, but if you got air vents in the floor, you can set your watermelon on top of that air vent right there. Yeah, and, cool uh, it off a little bit. It'll be nice. Or nice you folks cool. that live up north where you got them cold streams, we used to put them in that when we went on vacation every now and then and let them stay in there a few hours and that'd cool them off too. Yeah, you find your little nook between some yeah. rocks where you know it ain't gonna go nowhere yeah. and set it in there. Yep. And, uh, I pile sure. them up underneath the pecan tree and I'll take me a break about every two hours, two and a half hours, and I'll go out there and sit by myself and let's say somebody wants to go with me and I'll sit there and eat me a watermelon. It's a good thing you plan a heap of them this year because if things keep going the way it is, your watermelon eating quota is going to be uh, yep. elevated, I feel like. Yep. Yep, it's kind of a stress line for me. I go out there and talk to the watermelon. Me and the dog go out there and he'll sit down with me old tank and we'll eat watermelon. <laughs> now, I don't get greedy and eat it all the way down to the rind. I'll throw it over to the horses, old Ringo, my donkey. He likes it. And Belle, she's my big old perch run. She likes them too. So I'll give them a little bit to share with them. I eat the heart out of them pretty much and go on. If I want another one, I'll bust me another one up and eat them till I had me enough. Ain't no point in fighting around them seeds too nope. much, is it? I eat me a belly full. If I want to eat two, if I want to eat three, however many I want to eat, and I get up and come on back to work. All right. That's good stuff there. So if you have any more questions about watermelons that we didn't get into, get into or if you got some good watermelon stories out there, some good varieties, that you'd like to see us carry, put those in the comments below and we'll be glad to get to them on next week's show. We got some questions from last week's show here. And if we do answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hosstools.com and we'll send you a nice little prize. Did I tell you that sauerkraut was good? That's Ooh, some good it's stuff. pretty good stuff. I, I, you did all right on that. I'm, I'm, I'm proud yeah. of myself. You should be. That's, I don't have, I, that's one thing I will confess that I ain't that great at is the food preservation, ferment, and all that kind of stuff. I just... Your mom's kind of got that figured out. I don't know I much about to, it. I yeah. don't know much about it, but I, I'm proud of myself. You did good. Bit. I'm proud of you too. Probably if you're bringing it today, before I can partake in it. <laughs> Our first question is from Mike Henderson. He says, Travis, when did y'all sow your onion seed last fall? So I started, I sowed some as early as, I want to say late August, early September. Uh, and then I sowed some kind of all the way through October there. And what I found was that I can almost succession plant my onions and it's worked really good for me because I had, uh, especially for my market farmer operation, I can pull some of those big green onions right now and I've still got some others coming along that I can count on and I can let them dry off. So I'd say any time between, because I planted some as early as October last year and they did fine. So you could start them late August, any time through September. Uh, those 338 trays we got now work awesome for onions. Work really good for them. And, uh, it, I'm I'm a firm believer now. 
and growing my own onion plants and getting them things in the ground early. Uh, the earlier you get them in the ground, the bigger the onions you're going to have sooner in the spring. And uh, that's just how I feel about it. Yep. I planted the onion bed in the ground. I did a little experiment with that. And I did fine. Got my plants out there. The problem I have was weeds. It's hard to control weeds in an onion bed. You can grow a heap of, in a 338 tray, you know, 338 onion plants. That's a lot of them. That's a row. Yeah. It's a long row. Long row or, or a short double row. Sure. All right. Number two is from Sheila Fade. And she says, how long can you store your seeds? With all these new gardeners out there, got smaller gardeners, a lot of people been asking, well, I don't need 50 tomato seeds or 50 cucumber seeds. What can I do with these seeds? Can I keep them while they store them next year? Yeah, that's a pretty good question. You know, and it's uh, different seeds. You got different answers for different seeds. I start out with how you store your seeds. Seeds do not like extremes. So you don't want to have store seed underneath your carport where it could get 100 degrees or it could get down to 30 degrees later on and you have those large extremes in there. You want them to be at a constant temperature or constant environment. Put them in the refrigerator, there's nothing wrong with that. We in our seed room, the rule of thumb on commercial seed storage is, is to keep your humidity plus your temperature. If you put the two together, you keep them below 100. And we keep our um, seed room at 60 degrees and 40 percent humidity we got a couple of big units back there and some pretty sophisticated electronics that takes care of all that so as long as you keep a low humidity and a constant temperature room temperature is fine just keeping a lot of people don't think so but you can keep if you keep your house at 78 degrees all the time there's nothing wrong with those it's seeds. a hot house 78 well, i can't degrees. afford to be keeping it down where you can kill hogs in there <laughs> 78 degrees. But if you keep those at a constant temperature, you're going to be okay. You just don't want them going to the extremes. That, that, that being said, some seeds store better than others. Brassicas, for instance, store real good from year to year. No problem whatsoever. Peas, on the other hand, do not carry over very Field well. Field peas, you buy some zippers from us, you better plant them this Plant year. them because they, they, the drum's going to go way down on Onion next year. Onion seeds also don't keep very well. Right. Certain seeds store real well, certain seeds don't. So there you have it. Uh, this is, and, and I'm not just saying this because I want people to have to rebuy seeds every year. If you've got some heirloom variety you're pre trying to preserve, put them in the fridge or freezer so they stay good and you can keep your seed stock up. I wouldn't buy seeds to save for the next year and plan to. If you've bought a pack of cucumber seeds and you're just going to plant half of them, share them with your neighbor, give them to somebody who can use them. Those seeds are going to do a lot better for you when they're fresh. Uh, when they've been germ tested recently, you know what you're getting there. So that's kind of my two cents. Yeah, I agree. Let us do the storing for you. And we run through enough, enough seed. We can have new seeds for you next year. So. Fresh. Fresh. All right. Mr. James Billingsley says, I have six beehives and want to know if spinosad will have an adverse effect on bees. Not if you spray it at the right time and do it right. You want to be spraying your spinosad right at dark. Right before dark, right at dark. I even spray it after dark sometimes. I put my backpack spray on with a headlamp and I go out there and spray it after dark. You don't want to spray it uh, when those bees are out there pollinating. Um, That's pretty much a rule with anything. Yeah, it's a good, good. And a lot, because a lot of chemicals like you neem, some of the other stuff, it, it'll burn that plant if you put it on when it's hot. So as long as you spray it late in the evening, I've got a beehive right beside my garden. I've been spraying spinosad a while. I haven't ever killed any bees with it uh, or noticed any decline in my bees. Uh, so as long as you spray it responsibly, once the bees have gone to bed, you'll be fine. Number four is uh, from ASL Havard Homestead. And he says, what do you mean by H-E-A-L, potatoes? Now, I've been getting this question a lot lately. Especially people who are new to the channel, they watched that HOA collab video we did, and they was worried how we was going to cure some taters, how we was going to heal them up. Well, healing potatoes in our uh, language means when you get ready to plant them, about three or four days before then, you want to cut them up. And, and a lot of people lay them out and dry them. I don't do that. I just put them in a five-gallon bucket. But you want to cut those potatoes up and get you three or four good pieces. Now, they talking of about healing. So... Heal. I say H E A L. Let me clarify something. So when people hear us talking about healing potatoes, are we gonna heal? Ooh, the, I see where you at now. Dirt, 
This heel, is where the heel, confusion comes in. Yeah, okay. Because I asked my wife the night, I said, I said, the word heel, H-I-L-L, -L, and the word heel, H-E-A-L. I said, say that. She, her accent is bad as mine. I said, say both of them words. Are they supposed to sound the same? And she said, yeah. I said, okay. Well, I'm not doing too much wrong there. People hear that word, I'm a heel potatoes, and they think you're going to cure them or something. Like you're going to heal the coronavirus. I got you. I got you. I they got you. don't realize we're I'm talking about it, throwing dirt. To I'm them. picking up what you're putting down. Now. I don't know how to say that word. And, and Healing. Healing, I guess. Is, that ain't no better. <laughs> that ain't no better. Anyhow, what we mean is throwing soil or dirt to it and back mounting it on up is what we mean when we're talking about that. Yeah, you heal corn. People heal, heal corn. beans sometimes. Yeah, it don't mean we lay no mojo on them. That means we just put <laughs> the dirt on them. <laughs> All right. All got? right, Bootstrap Gardener. He says, "How can I, oh you know, how can I mix BT and spinosad?" You could mix BT and spinosad, but I don't really know why you'd want to. Uh, those two things, those two products, kind of target the same species or the same pests. Uh, spinosad is a little more. Uh, kick it up a notch than BT is, uh, but they pretty much target worms and stuff like that. Spinosad has a little wider range of what it can target, but you wouldn't want to mix those two because they both do pretty much the same thing. Use one or the other. If you don't want to use Spinosad, you can always just use BT, and if your problem gets real bad, you can come in there with the Spinosad. Uh, yeah, let me add a little bit of this. I, you could mix, B, I could see where it'd be beneficial to, to mix BT and neem or BT and uh, pyrethrin together. Or I mix Spinosad or, and liquid or vice copper. Versa. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, there is some, some benefit to doing some of the mixes. The BT and Spinosad, you don't gain a lot by mixing those two together. Use those in a rotation to mix some other things together like uh, uh, Pyrethrin, I had a brain cramp there. Pyrethrin, neem, or fungicide. Or, or excuse me, fungicides, yeah. Yeah. You can rotate them to keep the pests from the game, but I wouldn't mix them because you, you just ain't doing a whole lot there. Number six here is from William Reese. He lives in Zone B in Central Florida. Says he don't have a frost date. Wants to know about aphids. Says he's been eat up with them um since the weather warmed up he's used neem oil and other organic options can't seem to get rid of them can you recommend a treatment whether it's organic or not well it sounds like he's going after them in the right way uh one of the things about aphids is you got to stay after them now they will crash as we say they'll go through a generation or two and they'll crash on their own and you will actually see a period of time there where you don't have an aphid problem what's happened is they have crashed on their own they breed so much and then yep. there's not enough they'll just crash the out staying after them with uh Pyrethrin or either neem, either one, stay at them pretty heavy. The key there is getting good coverage when you spray. Spray that plant down good and just keep a monitor and see where you're at. Aphids don't do a lot of damage unless the population gets real high. So if you got a couple or three, I don't worry about it a whole lot. They'll take care of themselves. But if you do get uh, a buildup of them, go in there and try to help them along, take care, take themselves out, and, and hit them good with some of that neem or pyrethrin. Those aphids are easy to kill. It's just a point of getting home. They're soft-bodied insect, and they're easy to take care of. So any of that, I've even seen people use dome dishwash detergent to kill them. Yep. Anything would just about kill them if you get it on them. You know, ladybugs help with aphids oh, yeah. big time. And yep. I, I didn't do this on purpose, but about three years ago, I had a big problem with aphids uh, on some field peas I was growing. And then uh, so I quit growing the field peas, and I've had a lot, and I'm not put them out there. Now, I grow my flowers to attract, you know, beneficial bugs, stuff, but I've had a lot more ladybug presence in my garden the last few years and i've noticed a lot fewer aphids now i know you can go online and buy ladybugs and turn them loose a lot of people do that in their greenhouses so if you can figure out a way to to boost that ladybug population to hip up with your aphids. oh yeah i want to go over a new product we got in real quick oh i about forgot about that yep so we got this complete organic fertilizer well, i'll say complete don't say complete on there no one it's an organic fertilizer. That's what it's called online. It's called okay. complete organic well, fertilizer. Well, we've had this in a 3.5 pound bag, but we got it in in a 10 pound bag. Mm -hmm. And I've done some pretty extensive work with this particular product right here. And this is a pelletized hen manure. Which means it has calcium. It does have loads of calcium in it. And uh, it really works well. What I want to show you right now is a leak that Miss Hoss grew in her garden. I'm gonna have to work with Miss Hoss on her leeks. 
And the only thing she put on it was this this fertilizer here. Now she needed to have buried them further up to get the white on it. We got that. Yeah. But don't you look, that is a nice, nice leak right there. And the only thing I had on there was this product. Now one thing that I have noticed with working with this, you really got to get those microbes feeding and going for this stuff to work at its full capacity or potential. I like to incorporate this into the soil about a week before I plant. Mm -hmm. And then I like to come back about two weeks after my plant gets up and side dress along to it. What you'll see with this product here is the release of the nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium will spike, come back down, and it will level off, and later on it'll spike again. So by adding those two to three applications, two to three weeks apart, you can pretty much get your little bumps, but it levels out along. Man, it'll make you look like a hero. Yeah, I wasn't gonna. Uh, I, was, I was gonna keep this under wraps, but uh, my carrots that, that finally kind of come through, you know, for me. Um, this is about a month or so ago. I went in there and I put a pretty heavy dose of this right here uh, down beside them, and uh, I did it with some rutabagas too. And I uh, didn't get as much greenery, which is I was going for more big rutabagas, and uh, grew some really big rutabagas with this stuff. And folks, don't let that five, four, three analysis fool you i mean this stuff right here packs a punch and uh and does jam up so don't think oh well you usually recommend 20 20 20 this is a fourth of the potency there for for whatever reason because it's organic and whatever this stuff I, I won't say it's as equally potent as 20 20 20 but it 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 unloads on that plant pretty good. Yeah, and the healthier your ecosystem is with your <coughs> soil, the better this will work. If you've got dead high salt content soils, this isn't going to work very well for you. But if you've got a good, healthy soil system, this stuff here works wonderful because it's got to go through that process there. Mm -hmm. And, I and think, that's what you're after anyway. You're after a good soil system there. I think the rate on that is about a cup, a cup and a half per 10 square feet or so. Yeah, a cup garden. and a half per 10 square feet. So these are enough here to do a good bit. Yeah, you can do, uh, I used uh, a bag or two of this per one of my thousand square foot pots. Uh, so, we got the- That's a big old leak. Y'all got healed them leaks. Well, we're gonna do better on right that. No, I know, but still, that's a big old leak. Anyway, get you some of that. We got it in three and a half, 10 pound. We also have a 30 pound option. If you want three 10 pound bags, you can save a little bit by getting some of those. So uh, we got that there. Hope everybody enjoyed the show tonight. And if you did, check out these two videos right here. One is where Greg is showing when to harvest a watermelon. And another one's there showing how you plant your watermelons on drip tape. Some more good watermelon stuff there. Check that out and we will see you guys next week. Stay, stay safe and stay good.